and welcome to this edition of Authors at Alden. I'm Scott Seaman, I'm Dean of Libraries, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you tonight for um, this latest event. Tonight, we have a conversation between Doug McCabe and Catherine Ziff about Catherine's book, um, Asylum on the Hill, History of a Healing Landscape. The book produced in cooperation with the Ohio University Press. Catherine is also a mental health counselor at the Plains Elementary uh, in the Plains near Athens. Asylum on the Hill was published in 2012, so we're just past the one year anniversary of the publication. And a recent review in the issue of the library magazine Choice said that this is a beautifully written, articulately researched historical work that tells the story of the Athens Lunatic Asylum. It also tells the story of the life and times of patient care in Ohio. Choice awarded its highest recommendation and it's a real privilege for us to have Catherine with us tonight. I will say that the Ohio University has brought a few copies of the book for sale in the corner back there and I'm told Catherine will be willing mm -hmm. to sign. Sure, yeah. For those of you joining on the web, I'd encourage you to get a copy of the book at your local bookseller, or you can just uh, Google Ohio University Press and order it directly from the press's website. Hosting our conversation tonight is Doug McCabe. Doug is curator of manuscripts in the Mon Center for Archives and Special Collections here in Alden Library. He's our resident expert on the Athens Asylum. Doug has also put together an extraordinary display of rarely seen archival materials that's just off to the side. If you've not had a chance to see that, please, after the conversation, take a look. We also welcome our online audience as we are webcasting this live with the help of our friends at WOUB Public Media. Thanks as well to everyone at the Ohio University Alumni Association and Office of Event Services for all of their help. Thank you all for coming. And Doug and Catherine, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, well thank you, Scott. And welcome, Catherine, and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and for everybody on the web as well, what a thrill. This is the first time uh, the uh, Authors at Alden has been done over the web, so we hope that this is a, uh, an important beginning to webcasting. Wow. With Doug. Where do we, <laughs> where do we start? Doug. Right. <laughs> well, why don't we start with... Uh, where you're from and, and, uh, and what, you know, what led you on up to Athens? Like you went to school someplace, you were born somewhere, all those fun things. Well, I'm from North Carolina and moved here with my family about 15 years ago. This is our 15th year here. And um, I have various degrees. Um, I have a, a doctorate from Ohio University here in, in counselor ed. Also one from Wake Forest in counseling before that, a master's degree in public policy and way back sociology from Chapel Hill. And all those um, strands of education kind of came together with uh, um, the focus of, of the book, actually. Well, and then you needed to do a dissertation for your doctorate here. I and, did. Uh, and that's where this all got started. Right. Where in the world, you know, I, I was thinking on the way in here tonight, you know, I know I'm weird, and that's why I'm really interested in the asylum and all that kind of thing, but I know you're not weird, and I'm not sure why you got going on it. Actually, it, it was my mother's idea. It was my mother's idea. I was uh, thinking, oh, 12, 13 years ago about a dissertation topic. She came up from North Carolina to visit me uh, with my father and couldn't help but notice the asylum up there, and she said, well, why don't you write about that asylum up there on the hill? Ah. And that was actually a very good fit, being a mental health counselor and also um, having studied public policy, um, in particular, 
years ago at Virginia Tech, I became interested in the work of sociologist Martin Ryan, who spoke of storytelling and narrative as a way to, to do public policy analysis. So, so that were some strands that really fit for me in, in, in beginning this research, which ultimately became a book. Well, and then you had to figure out uh, where in the world to go looking for stuff. Right? I did, <laughs> and you ask one or two questions, and all roads lead to you, Doug. <laughs> right? Well, and and so I began asking about the asylum, which uh, led to to Doug, to you, and to Alden's um, uh, the Mon Center for Archives and Special Collections, which, if you don't know, is on the fifth floor, and is just a Fabulous, fabulous place. Very, uh, probably of a quiet reputation, but a, a wonderful living um, archive, I like to think of it. So, and Doug, you told me a very important thing. Uh, you're very patient. I know you have a lot of uh, people come and ask you about the asylum, asylum. You're very patient, but you said, it's a room with a thousand doors. And I thought, a room with a thousand doors. Meaning by that, there are so many ways to study the place, whether time periods, eras, um, the treatment methods, the people, the, the psychiatry, um, the cemeteries, the Civil War, how, how are you going to narrow it down? And so I narrowed down to the idea of studying the asylum and its interactions, its connections with the community of Athens. But still, there was over 150 years of history, and, and where do you go to begin to focus? And so what time period? Well, very quickly, I had a dream. And sort of being in mental health, you know, I write down my dreams. I take note of them. A um, little bit of a Jungian strand there. And I dreamt that I was in the uh, attic of the asylum, way up in the attic. Now, I have been in the attic, and it's a very uh, kind of uh, cramped feeling, low ceilings. It's dark. It's dusty. There are small windows. But in, in the dream attic, it, there were... I'm in one very spacious room. There were many rooms, but I was in one room. It had high ceilings, polished woodwork, painted walls, big windows you could see outside. But it was full of very old artifacts, antique furniture, old kind of Victorian silver candlesticks, mirrors, all kinds of old artifacts. And so that kind of led me to the idea of studying the asylum at the very, its very beginning years. Um, the, as it, the six or seven years of construction and formation, and then the 20 years, ending in about 1893, of uh, the moral treatment era. So that, that took me to that. And then you begin to, to uh, widen again. So you develop uh, you know, research methods. You develop a, uh, how do you develop categories uh, to, to study? Because but still, even within that time period. So it's a process of making long lists of details from history books, asylum, some of the basic information that's available, and coming up with general topics to begin to study, which then became chapters of a book, chapters of your dissertation. So you collapse all these details into several categories, eventually the landscape, architecture, patients and families, um, business and politics, which kind of go together, uh, and, and caregivers. So, and from there then, with these categories in hand, you begin to dive in into the archives. Um, and that's when the archi uh, archivists start uh, opening drawers, bringing out boxes, bringing out photographs. Um, and, and, and just a word about archivist Doug, and I want to say also Bill Kimmick and Janet Carlton and Judy and, and, and George Bain, who, who was there earlier, are, are experts, archivists anywhere are experts at co-researchers. They're your very best friends in a research project, especially uh, when you're, you're dealing and reading about things where there's no one alive. It's very solitary, so it's really important to have um, you know, your, your archivist co-researchers. They're always there. They're always interested in what you're doing. They're always willing to go find a box, bring it out, and also to suggest a resource that you haven't thought of. Um, and they're always happy for you when you make some progress. You find some little snippet that gives you a window into uh, one family's life as related to a patient at the asylum. And it's so exciting um, because these things are hard to find. And you know the archivists get excited, excited with you. So um, very important. Uh, uh, the role of not only all the information, but the archivists themselves. So. Well, and I just, you know, I remember back in those days when you were doing your research, you know, and you'd pull up this and go, look at this. Uh, and it was new information for me, too. And that was really exciting and interesting to pick up on that and then be able to uh, pass that along to other people who are coming mm -hmm. in and approaching that thousand-door room from a different door. 
mm -hmm. uh, because it really is that way. Uh, you have all these hundreds, thousand approaches into that one institution. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think one of the important things that, that you're pointing out, and I think this is very important, is any of us really, you know, whether we're still students or were students, you know, have, have gone through that, that process of narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down, mm -hmm. tightening things up. Mm -hmm. so that you can come up with something that makes some sense beyond uh, a you know, third grade book report, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that thing. Yeah. And with primary research. Uh, you know, well, right. And that was, you know, so you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, did, did you find that you, you, you uh, turned to secondary sources uh, first, you know, like general histories of asylums in America and things like that, and, and that, did that help guide you towards you know, what at least direction of themes, I, I would guess? Yes, actually there was something on every floor um, of, the, of the library that I used. Um, first floor you have microforms, um, where all the microfilms, and you can go back and read way back uh, the Athens Messenger, if you can, how long you can uh, read those microfilms without getting seasick, you know, back and forth, but there you could read uh, the accounts of the parade that was held when the, the asylum was, uh, the cornerstone was laid, or you can read about their um, uh, you know, social gatherings that were held, private parties that were held at the asylum, or the Fourth of July celebrations, or if a patient had escaped, so you could read in that which was, which was a sort of popular culture in newspapers. And then on the, uh, let's see, second floor, um, we have the cafe and we have the computers, so there's always things to do there. Uh, the third floor, fine arts library, if you wanted to look, in some cases I wanted to look back at some of the books, art books that have, are, are devoted to art uh, made by patients in uh, asylums across the world, you can go and look at that. Fourth floor, you check out books. Fifth floor is the, the um, really heart of all the, the archives, the Mon Center for Archives and Special Collections, government documents, which have very important source of information about the asylum that anyone can access, and those are the annual reports, where they are long lists of what was purchased, lots of information aggregated about patients, um, narratives from the superintendents about what was important that year, what they needed from the state, um, the trustees' reports, staff changes, just um, huge resource there. And then on the sixth and seventh floors, you have the histories, the histories of the Civil War, of Ohio, of the nation, um, as related to the time period, um, medicine, psychiatry, history of psychiatry. If you want to understand about post-traumatic stress disorder and what it might have been called during the Civil War, Soldier's Heart, you could read in the book and, and you know, get, get all that kinds of general background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so you have all that. You found that you needed for your research to get into records that uh, are classified mm -hmm. as classified. Mm -hmm. uh, because of HIPAA, um, HIPAA laws still govern um, very old medical records, which asylum uh, uh, commitment documents are. And, and the Iman Center holds thousands uh, up to 1913. Yeah, approximately 1874 to 1913, mm -hmm. and then there are some gaps in there, too. Of commitment documents, which would include a, a decision from the probate court, a narrative from a physician, and sometimes other things put in. And those, you have to either um, show that you are a, a direct relative of a patient, or you go through a process of approval from the State Department of Mental Health to show that you're doing research. And then you have access to all those patient records as well as files which contain um, things like letters that patients wrote but were confiscated and, and not mailed, um, letters that were written to patients, um, a case book which is uh, in, in the library in Columbus and things like that. So then you begin to delve into um, days and days and days of reading uh, narratives of, uh, of, of, commitment, of patient, commitment of patients. I read all the ones you can look up, there's some cross-reference book, you can look up and find out where people were from. I read all the ones for people from Athens and then expanded and read, I don't know, thousand, a thousand or more other documents. Yeah, there's loads yeah. of them. Well, yeah. it's, uh, the way things were for the uh, Athens Asylum, it covered southeast Ohio. Now that's kind of 18 counties in southeast Ohio so it could go as far east as Belmont and then as far west as Lawrence County 
as far north as, uh, I'll say, Fairfield County and then to the Ohio River. But that could change over time. And so some counties would be added and some drop. And then, too, I don't know if you looked at some of these, but there were times when there were transfers of patients mm -hmm. from, say, the Columbus Asylum or the Cleveland Asylum, even as far away as Cleveland. Uh, I assume that was from yes. overcrowding up in Cleveland. When the so, asylum opened, that happened. And also patients mm -hmm. were taken from poor houses, county homes around the state who, who were... Um, who had mental illness or were deemed to have that, and they were brought here as well, sometimes on the train in straight jackets. Right. Um, so the earliest patients, uh, many of them were brought over from Dayton or Cincinnati where there were already asylums. Columbus already had an asylum, so did Cleveland. Toledo came after mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Athens Long Asylum. Yeah. But so I think it, you know, out of 88 counties in, in, the, in the state of Ohio, there's something like, I don't know, 50-some counties represented. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these counties would only have maybe a couple of patients who might be sent here, but uh, still. You know, and, and this was done through pay, probate court, so there had to be an application for a person to be sent mm -hmm. to the Athens Asylum, meaning that the mm -hmm. asylum had the final decision as to whether to accept any patient or not. And one of the things, and I don't know if you mm -hmm. looked at these, but we do have some rejected yes. applications. Yeah. Rejected, and they would say rejected, not insane, or sometimes it was very difficult for um, for the staff to to figure out how to best care for people with seizure disorders, and they were kind of discouraged and, and would not accept sometimes people with uh, what they called epilepsy then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you agree that um, in those first years in particular, and, and I guess maybe through a good bit of that moral treatment time period, we're not seeing professional psychiatrists or psychologists. We're seeing mostly just regular doctors. Oh, as far as the commitment goes, it would be a, a doctor, a, a physician somewhere in a county, absolutely. Uh, psychiatry was just beginning as a pr profession, and, and um, the asylum superintendents were, were part of that, but as far as the physicians would go, it would be a, a regular general practice kind of a mm -hmm. physician, making their best guess. So you would be reliant upon your, your local county physician to decide whether you were And what family insane. and friends came and said to you, about you, to the court as mm -hmm. well, yeah. 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 So. Moral treatment, what, you know, I think most people, and I think myself too for that matter, when I first heard that, so these people are immoral and we're going to turn them into moral people? I mean, it, it's probably more than that, isn't it? I mean, it, that's not yeah. really all there was to it. Exactly. It was um, moral in the sense of humane treatment. And it came from um, a Quaker-based um, small asylum that was built in England in the 1790s. William Tuke, Quaker tea merchant, he thought something needed to be done. And he built a small asylum. And um, it was to feature regular kind treatment, humane treatment, um, regular meals, activities were part of the treatment, um, beautiful views, um, work and walking outdoors. And this was really a sea change from earl the earlier assignments when the treatment was relied on uh, very punitive kinds of things, uh, uh, shocking things like um, a trap door, uh, it was called the bath of surprise. Uh, uh, there would be a trap door in the floor and a patient, it would be opened when a patient was walking and you'd be plunged into cold water with the idea that you could be shocked out of uh, your, your um, mental illness. And so, so this idea of moral treatment was a um, very big change. Brought to the United States. Uh, um, and picked up by Kirk, a Quaker. Kirk, yeah, picked up by another Quaker in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane, Kirkbride. Hence the Kirkbride um, architecture uh, he developed and brought to America, uh, a um, codified how this moral treatment should be done, and architecture and landscape were a good part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's the architecture, it's the landscape, and then with the architecture, you, as you can kind of see with the drawing behind us here, most of those windows indicate private rooms. They're mm -hmm. probably, what, about 9 feet by 12 mm -hmm. feet or something mm -hmm. like that? They were built small so that the temptation would not be to double people up. Which was quickly, <laughs> uh, yeah. quickly abused, but the idea being that people had private space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and private time mm -hmm. 
And then in between, you, there were day rooms, I guess mm -hmm. we, you might call mm -hmm. them now. Mm -hmm. Parlors. Activity rooms, mm -hmm. parlors. Mm -hmm. And uh, situated to catch the prevailing breeze, the, uh, you know, the mandala shaped, the round grill work that's on the windows there was as for security, but it was kind of disguised as hopefully something beautiful rather than prison-like bars, though it did serve the same function. Um, outdoors, walking outdoors was a big right, airing. part of it. Airing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In case any of you are still believing that the, uh, the, the lakes out in front were in the shapes of playing card suits, they never were, and you can see some maps over here to show that that's the case. Uh, I think it's a matter of transference because when you look at the bars on the windows, mm -hmm. you can spot within the designs three out of four playing card suits. So, a legend dispelled, right? Okay. Not there. Not, Not there. there. Yeah. Yeah. So, the treatment. earliest treatments included still these, these cold baths and hot baths, right? Right. Or but there's just no trap door. Right? No trap door. Well, later in the 20th century, there were, uh, you know, the, the, what, the needle showers, the salt wraps, um, hydrotherapy uh, came into play in the 20th century, electroconvulsive shock therapy, the lobotomy years, um, all mm -hmm. the chapters of psychiatry. But in those earliest days, it would have been... Soothing baths. Soothing baths, taking walks, um, exercise. Um, work, too. Work. Um, the superintendents were always saying we can't make, make people work, but it really helps them sleep better if they, if they can work. Um, this asylum, uh, the superintendents in the, in the uh, 19th century were leaders in Ohio of the non-restraint movement. So it was a very, very, very limited use of physical restraints and, and chemical strength sedatives as well. So they, were, they worked very hard to do that. Some patients had the walk of the grounds, others did not. It just depended. Well, uh, well, not in the earliest days, I guess, come to think of it, but there were enclosed areas later mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. like enclosed courtyards, yeah. so that uh, more excited patients might be able to still get outside. Mm -hmm. Move around some. Yeah. Yeah. And what's in, one of the things that's inter interesting to a, a counselor like myself is that some of these things in the last 20 years have come back into play as a complement to mental health treatment. Um, we know walking outdoors, uh, all kinds of wonderful data coming out now of the benefits of uh, walking outside for um, depression, for example, um, the use of art, um, and so forth. Some of these, these um, moral treatment kinds of things are, are, are back with us. Well, an art and, and um, well, and indoor plants were very popular at the time mm -hmm. as well. Oh, yeah, there was a greenhouse uh, that kept um, flowers, uh, you know, uh, supplied throughout the asylum. Um, walks outside, out through the grounds. And in Japan now, there's a movement called uh, forest bathing, in which we now know with, with quantitative means that uh, walk, two hours of walking in the forest will uh, raise your, um, lower your levels of depression and, and elevate your mood. All, all the things that they were doing then kind of... Uh, as best practice. Well, and I think you'll be able to see too with some of the materials on display, some of the older, now the, a lot of the sepia tone photographs there are, were taken in the early 1890s when uh, it was, they, they were very proud of the place at that point because it, it the landscaping had finally matured mm -hmm. and you have, well, we even have a paper about all of the flora uh, and the special plantings that were done uh, all around the asylum and the special walkways and you'll see photographs of cascades and, yeah. and falls. It was, it was and an all extraordinary that. landscape and it still is, you know, it still yeah. is. They're, vest they're vestiges of the old landscape. You can see the old stone uh, spring, there's still apple trees up there. It's, it's still the vestiges of those days. Yeah. Now I'd mentioned earlier about uh, no real training for most doctors. Uh, what kind of training did attendants have? At the very beginning, none. And as you could see, um, as the years went on, the superintendents would write in their annual reports, well, we really need to attend to um, who we choose to, be, uh, to hire to be attendants, um, how they're trained. And so eventually, by 1911, 1913, we had a nursing school here uh, that uh, trained nurses specifically to, to work in, uh, in asylums. Yeah, we also, yeah, again, to plug the display material, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, but it's also to give you some idea of 
all of the different kinds of records that we have in the, uh, the Mon Center to uh, help uh, when you open any one of those thousand doors. We have some employee records, including employment cards. Uh, you can leaf mm -hmm. through those and see so-and-so lasted one day. Uh, other people lasted, mm -hmm. you know, weeks, <laughs> wow, mm -hmm. or years for that matter. And, uh, and then you can also see their pay scale and their pay rates uh, when they were um, uh, given raises and, and, and that kind of thing. It's a great place to work. It was a, a, huge, a huge bonus for the town of Athens to have the asylum with all the, all the um, money that was spent in the town to buy everything that was needed. And uh, it was a people, this was during the period of the Long Depression, which was multiple years, decade long. Many businesses were, were failed. It was very hard times. And so to have a job at the asylum was uh, you know, a, a plum job if, if, you, if it agreed with you. In a place to stay at the asylum. You, could, you lived there, on site. How and many you had times a cell? did you read uh, a patient mm -hmm. uh, suffering from financial embarrassment, mm -hmm. if I remember mm -hmm. that one mm -hmm. uh, correctly? Financial embarrassment, yeah. yeah. Um, worry about uh, the, you know, a, a financial loss, yeah. I was, th I was thinking about the, the uh, in the book, there are several um, spots that have the letters and very interesting things that um, happen to be tucked away in those commitment documents, little treasures. And one was a, 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 a kind of a window into um, life, into a, a family in Ohio. How do you care for a, a, a family, who, family member who is quite ill? And um, a, an elderly man was brought here um, actually on the first day of spring in the 1880s. And a little note, I found a little handwritten note um, in pencil from the, the man's son. And he said, father was insane in the first of his sickness. Father was first doctored by Beers for the liver complaint. I think the treatment was a calomel with other medications. Beers being called away and could not attend, we called Dr. Anderson. He doctored him for the liver, kidney, and dropsy. Dr. Leflin said he must die, could not live two weeks. Anderson the same. He still continued to swell till his hips and legs, the skin bursted open, and his flesh looked like a cherry red, and he got entirely helpless. I boiled corn and lye and let the steam go to his wounds, and the swelling began to go down. I gave him spicewood tea, which I believe is also the red bud. It's another name for the red bud. I gave him spicewood tea to drink, used embrocation oil, and held his wounds, and in four days he began, four weeks he began to walk. Now this gentleman had erysipelas, which is blood poisoning and can lead to hallucinations. So he was weak and he was troubled by hallucinations and the farmer remained ill. And they did, did bring him, uh, making a 150 mile journey by wagon with this ill gentleman to bring him here. But just the measures that families would go to um, to try to um, take care of, of someone and then finally saying we've, we've got, to, got to get some more help here. And so many times that you find that example of uh, families working so hard for so long to keep that family member home mm -hmm. and then finally realizing that it just be yeah. had become too much. Yeah. On the other hand, you could find examples of let's get rid of this family member as quick as possible. Um, and that, They're you know, troublesome. Troublesome, troublesome mm -hmm. or uh, I have a trophy wife lined up and <laughs> those kinds of things. So as much as we have such a variety of reasons for people to be put in the asylum, and some of them I think we would both agree were mm -hmm. extremely questionable, mm -hmm. and others... Oh, yeah. How about the coal miner who was trying to start a labor union? There you yeah. go. <laughs> right. Still <laughs> into the asylum, yeah, in Nelsonville. One of my favorite stories. You know? Well, there were two, two reasons. The debate in psych psychiatry and the history of asylums is, did they come about uh, to provide a social good, to provide humanitarian care, or were they there to provide social control? And the answer is both. You know, we have people who were truly had mental illness. We had the coal miner trying to start uh, a labor union. We had a daughter who ran off and joined a brothel in Cincinnati and disgraced the family, you know, was, and was brought to the asylum. So, you know, women who were truly, um, truly ill with um, uh, postpartum depression, brought to the asylum, given some rest, restored, were able to go back to their family. So it's, it's a mix. And this too, I think, is something important to understand, and that is that many of these people uh, both the administration and, and the staff, as well as the families, expected these people who became patients 
to not be in the asylum for all that terribly yeah. long, mm -hmm. that they needed uh, asylum. Yeah. They needed sanctuary. The, the true word of asylum, the true meaning. Right. Yeah. Sanctuary. Now, as it turns out, of course, there were a number of people who were there for many years, mm -hmm. many decades, mm -hmm. became institutionalized, if you will, mm -hmm. could not operate or function outside of such mm -hmm. a uh, mm -hmm. controlled situation. There was a lot of coming and going when you look at the records also. Someone would get better, go home, relapse, back to the asylum. Oh, I've seen numerous cases. You, know, you can find this in the uh, uh, admissions uh, Book. In, Same index name. that we had, yeah. yeah, and a lot of times it'll say RE for you know readmitted, mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of them are six or seven times, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time then released so that they could go back, you know, as re released as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if you bring them in and make them stay. Another thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, what was your take on uh, uh, those like Civil War soldiers that you you would come across? Oh yes, there were. Um, I looked specifically for examples of commitment documents that would indicate that someone was hospitalized because of post-traumatic stress, and indeed, they, they were there. Um, and there were also family members. For example, there were mothers who were there who were just unredeemably depressed because of the loss of their, their, the men and their family from the Civil War. So absolutely, we have Civil War veterans um, buried in the cemetery and who were hospitalized some were able to, to leave, some were not. Now, I don't have any mm -hmm. credentials to, to make this statement, really, but my feeling has been for a long time that particularly for those first 20 or so years of the, uh, of the asylum, so and the asylum opened in uh, January of 1874, yeah. so that's only a few years at, mm -hmm. after, well, it's not, what, nine years mm -hmm. after the end of the Civil War, that m almost all of the people who were patients there were really veterans of the Civil War, be they All male the or female, yeah, somehow. Uh, or staff or patients. Mm -hmm. But the women would, I'd classify as veterans as well because of their family members having mm -hmm. participated mm -hmm. in that war. Yeah. And I read of a, a, 50, a boy who was 15 and he, he joined a regiment, he was at Chickamauga, he was at Shiloh, he was all the, all, you know, for years and finally um, he just, you know, gave way under, under the stress of all that. And, was hospitalized as soon as the asylum opened. Yeah. Now, in the three cemeteries that are up there, there are at least 89 military veterans. They start with the uh, Mexican War mm -hmm. and um, seem to go as far as at least uh, the First World War. Mm -hmm. And we're finding then that, uh, well, I found uh, in some research I was doing, two of them were deserters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the stress apparently. Mm -hmm of the war itself was enough to make them desert even before the end of the war. Civil War, you know, produced presidents and senators and business leaders and it also, um, you know, some people just, some broke under the, the stress, so. And then there's things. Eli Stevens. Did you ever, did you really, did you look into Eli at all? Um, read his, uh, the Confederate. The document, yeah. Yeah. There was a guy who was a Confederate soldier and, uh, Imagine what his, he was in there for, what, I think 21 years. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was put in the asylum in 1874. Now, at that point, everybody else in the asylum are union people mm -hmm. and either veterans themselves or, you know, family members of veterans. I can't imagine that Eli got much sanctuary. Yeah, at the, at the asylum, yeah, and, and, the, uh, and the attendants. Yeah. Um, Eli, um, well, he was hospitalized for, uh, it's thought that he was part of a member of Morgan's Raiders, but we've not really been able to, yeah, to document so I'm still that trying directly. To pin that one down, yeah, but, but he, he was hospitalized because he burned down a church in, uh, was it MacArthur? It's somewhere in Vinton County. Yeah. yeah. You'd have to be crazy to burn down a church, right? Or at least they decided. Well, yeah. well the, the trial <laughs> said he was guilty yeah. and yeah, insane. And so. insane, yeah. yeah. It followed, yeah. So then. Okay, one of the things that I've talked about with people, and I'm sure you're much more qualified to talk about this than me, is that all of these various treatments were, they weren't designed as tortures by any means. I mean, there was, they were, there was thought behind them that this is going to help people. You mean with like the, uh, 
the taking the walks or the uh, well I mean that of course yeah. but then you know some of the other like the the, the hydrotherapies oh, the uh, right and like then the convulsive shock the, the yeah lobotomy the years lobotomy yeah. bad chapters um, well electric convulsive ECT therapy is back um, and yeah. but it's uh, much more controlled and I guess it's used um, in instances of depression uh, lobotomies were were shut down um, uh, after maybe a decade um, and the water treatments, some of them uh, sound pleasant, but the needle showers, things like that, uh, had a kind of a punitive ring to them. Yeah. yeah. So even though there were, you know, intentions were good, mm -hmm. well, these could mm -hmm. turn into uh, mm -hmm. unfortunate uh, yeah. Well, treatments. Well, yeah, I think um, medicine is uh, psychiatry through the through 150 years there are examples here and there you know you think of the uh, the Tuskegee experiments and so forth there's all kinds of examples of um, science gone wrong yeah I've had to wonder or <laughs> medicine gone wrong. many of these people are suffering a traumatic shock mm -hmm. which is what brings about the mental distress mm -hmm. and and to me the, the wonder is why would you visit shock on to someone who had shock you, you know wouldn't you go the opposite direction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we had deinstitutionalization, and the asylum um, uh, around the 70s began to be, um, uh, people were placed in the community. There was a big effort made, social workers and so forth, um, with all the imperatives, the federal imperatives, to deinstitutionalize. And uh, that coincided with the advent of medications. Thorazine came out, and, and then uh, so on. Um, and we had the Community Mental Health Care Act, which was an, an un unfunded mandate. And so mm -hmm. we have done as best as we can um, since with um, you know, combination of small mental hospitals, um, lots of uh, as much community support as possible, combination of medication and therapy is what we have today. Jumping back to those early years, those first 20 to 30 years, um, one of the things we haven't really talked about in any detail, and we're and kind of running out of the formal time here, we want to give you all a chance to ask questions, questions or make comments, is the community mm -hmm. actions back and forth with the asylum. Mm -hmm. uh, w this is what churches and all kinds of other organizations here in town that had things going on. Oh, there. there was lots of interaction with the community in, in addition to the, all the financial exchanges, all the farmers bringing uh, things to sell. Um, the contracts for the milk, the meat, um, the coal, everything, the light, gas that kept everything running. Um, there were the, the pastors from the churches would go up and conduct Sunday services. There was uh, entertainments on Sunday afternoons that the town would be invited to come and people would go up to the concerts and the picnics and so forth. The grounds themselves were a very permeable boundary uh, between the asylum and the community and right away the grounds were used for um, outings, family outings, um, picnics. Sunday strolls and so forth, and it was just uh, kind of what you did. You went up and took walks, and there were patients there on the ground as well, so there, were, there was an exchange. And very much following that idea of Thomas Kirkbride and the Kirkbride plan, mm -hmm. having that uh, buffer, if you will, mm -hmm. that's not really a buffer. It's, it's much more of a, uh, of a way for these two communities to, to have a chance to mm -hmm. interact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have a photograph over here of people ice skating on the on the ponds, and I know a lot of people in town went, uh, well, and in the region, mm -hmm. really, uh, there for picnics, and uh, Ohio University students went there to uh, spark mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, get to know each other mm -hmm. <laughs> along Lover's Lane. Mm -hmm. and, and well, you know, and Athens continues to have, uh, to be um, an example of a place where um, mental health, some cutting edge mental health things are, are taking, taking place, which the 19th century moral treatment was cutting edge for the times, but we have the diversion program now, we have the, uh, the crisis training for um, first responders and how do you respond to someone who is, uh, is mentally ill, you know, rather than just, um, uh, you know, uh, something, in, uh, a criminal activity. So those are really, um, the people here in Athens who have generated those programs have been to Washington and gotten awards for them. So it's you know a small place with some um, important things still going on. Well, and now it's called, it's called the, the Ridges because it was turned over to Ohio University in 1988. I still think of it as a place for mental health. Mm -hmm. And I, every time I'm up there, I see dozens and dozens of people up there 
walking mm -hmm. with their yes. dogs or just by themselves yes. or using the orienteering course or or just mm -hmm. in, enjoying the outdoors all seasons throughout the year and it really Absolutely. is for mental health so I got very the restorative. high restorative. Yeah, very yeah, restorative. Yeah, very restorative. You got the high sign. I just got mm -hmm. the high sign. So let's turn this over to you all. What kind of questions or comments do you have? Yes. I'd like to know what period you covered in your, in your book, in your dissertation, and uh, if you ever uh, interviewed anybody that worked there, or patients there, mm -hmm. or it was entirely... Uh, uh, the dissertation and most of the book is... Uh, let Doug... Uh, oh. Do this for uh, the web people. The feedback oh. for the web people. Oh. So, what period were you uh, working with as far as your research? Mm -hmm. Did you interview any patients there? Mm -hmm. And, and staff. Mm -hmm. And staff. Mm -hmm. The book and the dissertation focus on the first 20 years. And so, um, but in the pro, and then we have the book also has a, a ep an epilogue that goes through the rest of the history. And in that process, I did talk to um, staff and uh, along the way have, have met patients as well. And some, they're cited, are cited in the book. Um, Someone on the webcast. But that's a project, you know, that, that needs to be done. It's a lot of oral history that, re, re, that, that resides, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doug. Someone on the webcast a little bit earlier asked, were there any notable patients that tried to pass themselves off as doctors and or visitors to escape the grounds, presumably? Hmm. That you know of. I don't know, but you know, they called them elopements um, back then. And they, they, you would read in the report, we had five patients elope, and um, I, 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 they just would, let, would leave. You would just walk off the grounds. One of them um, hopped a train and was last heard from working on a plantation off the uh, Mississippi River. Um, but then they would send people out um, to go try and fetch them back. But I don't know of anyone who, I don't think it was really necessary to go. You could just leave. You could just walk off. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. The, the place was never completely never enclosed mm -hmm. with fencing or anything. Right. There was a fence along Richland Avenue, but I think that was just, that's much more decorative. Ornamental. Yeah, yeah, ornamental. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, famous people escaping? Or was that part of the question? Passing themselves off. I think, as oh, positions. okay. Yeah. Just yeah. as doctors. Or, do or as doctors yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There, are, there, are, there are a couple of cases of doctors who were admitted as patients. Mm -hmm. Come across that. A lot of people. Yeah. Uh, your hand's higher. <laughs> hey, were, there, were there well known people, or is that something that can't, can't be determined because of the, the records? Yeah. I did encounter. So, were there oh. well known people? Mm -hmm. um, there. I did encounter some minor well known people, but uh, the terms of my agreement. Uh, with the state was that there would be not be any names or, or note of that. But no, nobody rich and famous, just a few um, local and state notables. Yeah. Of course, oh, that was Billy Milligan, I guess. Yeah, I was just say was out of my time period, but that was a whole book, The Lives of Billy Milligan, which you can read. Um, and yeah. I would suggest. Yeah. Someone following up on that online also asked, were there criminally insane uh, inmates or, or clients or patients there. People who had committed a crime and were mentally ill. Uh, well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is certainly, uh, I don't remember when Lima uh, State Hospital yeah. was was established, but uh, there are certainly, well, Eli Stevens, one of them we just talked about, was criminally insane. And there were, mm -hmm. there were certainly others uh, from Southeast Ohio like that as well. Mm -hmm. And typically they, I think, would have a little more special security. attention, yeah. more se higher security. Rutherford B. Hayes, before he was president, as a young lawyer in Cincinnati, um, one of his first cases, he prided himself in defending a young woman who had uh, done a crime, but uh, she was also determined to be mentally ill, and he was very pleased about that. His brother-in-law went on to be uh, superintendent at Longview Asylum, and he visited here uh, several times, this asylum. He was very closely um, allied with that. Were there African Americans? Someone online wonders there? Yes, yes. Hundreds. Mm -hmm. um. I, we know that it's in, in many asylums and in, in many locations, um, African Americans were segregated in the asylums or separate asylums were built. Um, we don't know, we don't really know geographically within this asylum how that took place, but there were lots. There were lots. And it, it, I've never seen anything that actually says mm -hmm. that they were segregated. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm making the assumption, uh, fair may, it may not be, but making the assumption that they were not segregated. When you look at photographs of staff, there are a few African Americans, mm -hmm. whether they were strictly to care for other African Americans or not, I don't know. I can tell you this, uh, because I had seen you know, plenty of evidence to this, that there is no segregation in any of the three cemeteries up there. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, this uh, Eli Johnson, the Confederate, uh, is buried up there, and right next to him is a, uh, a, a Union soldier who was in the uh, 21st United States Colored Infantry. So I think Israel Fitting. Johnson was buried there specifically to keep an eye on Eli <laughs> keep <that laughs> for in check. eternity, yeah. maybe. <laughs> there was a question right here. When and under what circumstances did all these materials come to Ohio University, the to the Mon Center? I don't know, for, for sure. Um, I think most of the materials came uh, between 1988 and the early 1990s, it was, it was before I got here, so I didn't witness some of that. But the, uh, those committal papers we were talking about, um, a lot of the the old photographs that we have here, some of the superintendent's mm -hmm. material, uh, which would be superintendent's correspondence, mm -hmm. administrative um, documents, including like the uh, employee records, right. the uh, payrolls, all those things came directly from the asylum. Um, we like to make noise about that, but we also like to keep it quiet because I think Ohio Historical Society thinks that they really own them. <laughs> and, and, and technically, the Ohio Department of Mental Health does own those records. I mean, we don't own them. They are uh, basically on deposit mm -hmm. here. And then we've added things off and on over the years, or even in some cases created some things mm -hmm. uh, specifically to just complement the collections we have here. There's one in the back, and then we'll get to you. Yes, sir. Biggest hope and biggest fear for conservation, preservation of the material. Of the, do, of the, of the documents or, or, or the, the ridges itself? Okay, you want to go first on that hot sure. topic? I, you know, one of the things that I don't hear about much in all the discussion that has suddenly, uh, we suddenly have is the, uh, are the grounds, um, which are, um, when you read the descriptions of them, they're kind of a, a rare example of some of the most beautiful and varied um, grounds, natural states uh, here in the county. Uh, there are old fields, there are meadows, there are old forests, some very, very old trees, and I don't, we don't hear much about what will become of the grounds. And uh, they're enjoyed by many, many people as a, as a restorative place to visit and walk and exercise and socialize. So I, I um, and, and they were a major part of the, the history here, uh, the, the, where the, the farms were, um, uh, the, their vestiges of the orchards and so forth. So I, I would love to see some of the concern about those grounds and pr preserving them uh, as they are, or even enhancing a little bit, tending them, um, take place. Then there are the buildings. If you look at the master plan, it calls for, for preservation of the, uh, the Kennedy and one wing out from there, as well as the buildings that have um, been renovated, which are the old cottages, the cottage style that were built where the Boinovich Center is now. And then the rest would be converted to parking, a new stair-step building that would go down uh, where the where building 20 is now. So there, there does stand a, a master plan that was approved a few years ago. Someone online asked if any of these records have been digitized or if they've been computerized and cataloged, that sort of thing. I'll say one thing. I, I do know when I was at the State Library of Ohio that they are beginning, some years ago, began a process of digitizing all the annual reports of all the asylums. That'll be fabulous when that happens, but it's not Yay. done yet. Yeah. yeah. Then we won't have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a whole lot of annual reports mm -hmm. anyway, but I, I think those are really great resources. Um, as far as what we're doing with things, we cannot digitize the committal papers because they are confidential by state law. So why bother digitizing them if nobody can, or very few people can really look at them? I should mention with that, though, 
that uh, there is now a process where if people uh, learn that they have an ancestor who was in the asylum and can fill out some paperwork that we will provide for them to fill out and then we can uh, release to them copies of those committal papers if we have them. So uh, that's become something very helpful to a lot of people who are doing genealogy, but also for people who have concerns about uh, perhaps uh, genetic disorders within their family. And uh, unfortunately, they're not going to learn much from these papers because uh, you know, something that says severe melancholia, well, what does that really mean today? I mean, it has a meaning. Uh, yeah. It just has an updated term for it, but it's not really. So we don't have patient records. We have these committal papers, and frankly, a lot of those can be accessed in, in any of the counties of in the state. Yeah. What has been digitized are the. Uh, there are a lot of images. If you look, go to the yeah. uh, the uh, digital collections of, of uh, Alden Library. There are many, many, especially the old uh, the um, 1893 set that went to the World's Fair. The photographs of the grounds. Those have been digitized and are available. Online. Right. So we have to also then be careful about digitizing anything else that would mention a patient's name. Uh, in that process, if we decided to, to try to digitize some of those records, we would have to redact all of those names out of there. It's very labor intensive, so therefore very expensive to do. So the chances of us doing a whole lot there in digitizing records is, is relatively slim. I can say this, though, that we are uh, working this year, uh, one of like sort of my main focuses is to uh, help put together some websites. One website will very specifically look at the cemeteries. Um, I've spent some years now identifying all of the people buried in all of the cemeteries, even the 1,700 plus people who are buried under just numbers. And uh, then we're also talking about a much bigger picture of doing a, a, a massive website on the entire complex so that you could zoom in on a certain building and click on it, bring up pictures, bring up whatever other kinds of records we might have about that building. So this is a, this is going to be a long-term project, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, Charlie. Well, I, all I'm oh, going to say is I had, I was a department head there when the hospital closed and I had in my office the floor of the Ramos lab. Oh. I uh, had a lot of artifacts that I meant to take, to, and it was it was closed down to us almost immediately. I think there was discussion about whether the Department of Mental Health, Ohio Historical Society, and so forth were going to, but I couldn't take even book pages and things like that that I'd had there for years and thought that I could just transfer to a new office. So, so they preserved that stuff almost immediately, not knowing what they were going to do with it or anything like that, but they didn't let them walk. Yeah. Or at least not, not hospital employees. There was some discussion about a new employee uh, walking off with uh, <laughs> artifacts out of there. Not, there, not hospital there was an auction at one point, I think, in the 70s, maybe, of, of a lot of the things, too. So. Yeah. yeah. And, I'm, and I'm always, uh, we are always interested in uh, records. Now, artifacts pieces of furniture and so forth, that's a little beyond what we as an archive are really all about. But records, kinds of things, photographs, all that kind of stuff. So if... Uh, I had a lot of photographs on my walls in, the, in my office. So you need to find out where they are now so we can oh, get a hold of them. <laughs> probably not. Oh, your president's office. <laughs> that could be. Okay. I hope you have them. I hope you have them. Uh, we might. You know, well, take a look. We, I have a lot of them out there. Charlie. Yeah. Uh, my name is Charles Murray Rose. I'm the grandson of uh, Dr. Charles Harry Creed. He was a superintendent at the post at, at the uh, state asylum. And uh, one one thing I'd like to say to Catherine, I've said this to her over the telephone, but I'd like to publicly thank her. She made a very nice reference in the book about my grandmother, Marcella Harding Creed. Uh, she was famous for. Uh, being such a compassionate woman, and uh, she would have birthday parties for the patients, and uh, she was talking about myths to dispel. And earlier in, uh, in her talk, and uh, 
one thing that I know was true, they, they used to have an alligator in a, in a uh, fountain in front of the main building and uh, kept it in uh, you know, water, a circular fountain. And in the winter time, uh, when it was too cold to have it out for the patients to be entertained by it, by it would be put in the basement. And uh, I, I just wish that uh, Dennis Powell was here tonight. He, he wrote a rather scathing uh, thing in the Athens News. And uh, believe me, this place needs to be preserved. It's, it's, a, it's a treasure. And uh, I'm just sorry that the younger people just don't realize, uh, you know, what, what a great place it was. Thank you. You're welcome. I have, there's a picture of the alligator and also a picture of where they kept the alligator in the wintertime, right over here. So. Uh, I was wondering if you had an opinion on the recent demolition of Building 26 and how you think that impacts the history. Well, uh, an opinion on the de recent demolition of uh, Building 26. Well, what's done is done. It's gone. Um, though it's not gone entirely, I hike up there a lot and, and learned that all the masonry and tile and concrete have been ground up and spread on the road that leads up to Radar Hill. So when you go walk up there now, we're, we're walking on, on those remnants of Building 26. Well, the more buildings that are taken down, uh, the more you lose the, um, the very unique resource that is here, which is a 150-year record of, of the history of psychiatry through, through its architecture. You have the moral treatment, you have the cottage style, you have the 50, all the way up to the 1950s and the 1960s. So you, you just have less and less of a complete, um, you know, complete historical perspective mm -hmm. on the ground. Very, I don't, hardly anywhere else in the United States are, are, is such a complete and taken care of facility uh, one of these hospitals exists. The Kirkbride hospitals were built in just about every state of the Union, um, probably close to 100 of them uh, across the United States. Many of these, uh, it, it is sad to see some buildings torn down. Um, at the same time, you know, think about the challenge that the university or the community has in trying to preserve uh, the buildings and the grounds for that matter. Uh, it takes money and it takes lots and lots yeah. of money. And the it takes are, purpose too. Mm -hmm. You have to have some reason to, to do something with those buildings. They're very, the, the original construction was very hardy. I've been told it will probably last another 150 years, but it's very expensive to renovate. Right. All the load-bearing walls so close together, very. Well, I'll go up here to the Kennedy Museum and look at the, uh, the depth of the window sills, like that. Okay, well, you know, we're gonna need to bring this up to code, so let's drill holes through here to, you know, to put in new electric, and you have to have a drill bit at least this long, and, and pay a, you know, some crew of people, you know, and it'd take a month to do all that. Yeah. Well, I, can, I was part of the discussion at the time as to whether to renovate the hospital or whether a new hospital would be built. And it, it was really prohibitively expensive to even yeah. thought about yeah. renovating that hospital and bringing it in. But that was the first thing that was discussed was to preserve it and to renovate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, you know, that just... Thinking of all the code standards, it must have been just... Yeah, well, there's, yeah. there's asbestos. There's asbestos, there's, mm -hmm. there's lead. And, and it, it just wasn't possible mm -hmm. to do that, so the new hospital got built. Now, at the same time, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, you know, advocating, you know, knock the whole place down. You know, I think it it's really ought question. to be not preserved as much as possible, yeah. as best as possible. But until you can have utility for those buildings, you know, what are you going to do with them? And money, yeah. And the money to do it then you just have to mothball them. And that's what the university has been forced to do for, well, for many years with a lot of those, a lot of those buildings. And done a beautiful job with the Kennedy and the Memorial Auditorium and the Voinovich Center buildings. Although I saw a really big hole in the roof when I was up there last week giving a tour. So Did you really? Yeah, yeah. It's a big one. I heard about that. It's like the size of a king-size mattress or something. I mean, it's... So let's all chip in and get some blue tarps, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or whatever. Because it really is a treasure, and, um, and and that's the buildings. But I think one of you know your point is very well taken. That's 740 plus acres up there that was turned over to Ohio University. 
doubling the size of the university here in Athens. Mm -hmm. 700 some acres here on the main campus and now out there as well. And mm -hmm. while there are things going on out there like the uh, orienteering and the land labs mm -hmm. and, and a lot of other things, there's a lot of other things that could be done and a lot of other projects that could be done. Simple, easy, cheap by students, student organizations, student groups and, and, and community people as well. It would help at least preserve the ground. Maintain the trails. And yeah, maintaining yeah. trails and all of that kind of thing. It's, and and I, you know, I can't emphasize this enough. It is a wonderful place for your own mental health, just to go up there and wander around. Yeah. And I see faces I know do that. Mm -hmm. you know, so. If you go to Cemetery One, there's always a well-supplied uh, set of brochures that, that mark the walks, the different walks that are up there. So you can just get a brochure and take a 30 minute or an hour, a two hour walk up there. So you can still go up there and spark. <laughs> so we have another question from our webcast. Someone is wondering if you give tours, if someone gives tours mm -hmm. of the grounds occasionally? Yeah, I'm available for tours. I think... Um, um, Tom Walker gives Tom tours. Walker. Uh, you can contact con Tom Walker. Through. George. George Ebert gives George tours. Ebert, yeah. uh, George Ebert is an employee here mm -hmm. at Ohio University. Tom Walker is a retired uh, political science professor. Probably the easiest way to contact him would be through the Athens chapter of NAMI, the National Alliance, uh, Alliance for, for, the mental mental, for the Mentally Ill. For Mental Illness, yeah. Or for Mental Illness, okay. And that, that could be Googled very easily, and you can find Tom's name. I've given tours. Um, I'm not sure who else. I'll do one if there's some people. I've done for third graders. Or yeah. <laughs> middle school kids. You can tailor it to however. Well, yeah. we've done um, the uh, Ohio University Alumni Association yeah. sponsors Hay Rides homecoming. Uh, at Homecoming, and uh, Catherine and I, and... George and Tom have mm -hmm. uh, uh, been the tour guides uh, for those. You can go things. through the Historical Society. Uh, George will, will do tours. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Good, good. So, yeah, there are tours. Uh, the last one I gave was last week, and that was two and a half hours. I don't know if you really want me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Although they said they liked it. So let's hope that they did. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. When the ridges were built, uh, was there already a system of institutions or facilities for uh, mentally retarded citizens whose families could no longer take care of them. Were there facilities for the mentally retarded as well? At that time, um, no. Uh, well, very, very soon there was, uh, in Columbus, there was an institution for what was called then the feeble-minded. But as far as when I, when I read the records and um, the, the case, the case uh, admissions documents, it, it appeared that this asylum here w was also a place where people were uh, admitted, developmental disabilities. And that could include, like you mentioned earlier, epilepsy, the very mm -hmm. first female patient. She was, 11-year-old child with epilepsy. Did you yeah. hear that? 11-year-old child. Little girl, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, very, very quickly, um, the uh, asylum leadership decided to start a farm, and it grew and grew and grew. By the by, the 1950s, in the annual reports, you would read and say there were we have three main purposes: to take care of our patients, to give advice to people who are not our patients, and our agricultural enterprise. There was a, a just a really well developed, um, robust. Uh, agricultural enterprise, vegetables, fruits, the beef cattle, the piggery, poultry, milk, uh, you the name it. The dairy operation. The dairy operation, yes. This is, the, this is the dairy barn, this is the 100th. <coughs> it, it wasn't entirely self-sustaining because you could see that where they were still having to buy some things and, and also they would trade if, say, uh, the asylum in, in Columbus had extra potatoes and there were more apples here that they would, they would swap back and forth. So there was a, a really large agricultural enterprise. Um, yeah, I think patients work there, staff work right. there. What you see is, like, is there's an evolution with um, treatments and an evolution with uh, training of people and so forth. There's also an evolution within the asylum as its uh, 
uh, whether it can be self-sustaining or not. It never really was fully self-sustaining. And it would ebb and flow as to how much they could produce yeah. on their own. If it was uh, a bad year for tomatoes, well, you'd have to. Right, yeah. And, and in the very beginning, they, they didn't really have a power plant. And then they, they were buying power from uh, here in Athens. They were buying milk and you know, eggs and all that other kind of thing. So, um, and, and, and really, the, the businesses around town uh, found that to be extremely important, uh, including the local stationery store and, and, and all of those kinds mm -hmm. of things. So there was quite a, a, th a back and forth going. You know, the, uh, now, it was in, up until all, like the early 1960s, that, that asylum was the largest employer in mm -hmm. all of Athens County and was only eclipsed mm -hmm. by Ohio University by the mid-1960s. Mm -hmm. So it was really the most important institution devoted to the mind in this area. Uh, this place was uh, of secondary importance mm -hmm. for most of the existence of the asylum, or most of the existence of this university for that matter. That's right. We are going to archive the video for this, and we'll have it on our website within a few days, so you can recommend this to other folks if they're interested in all of our guests online as well. If you're interested in some of the special collections at Alden Library, we have some brochures on a table over here, and you're more than welcome to have these. Some interesting things here in Athens at Alden Library and the Mon Center. Catherine Ziff, Doug McCabe, thank you very much for being with us on Authors at Alden. Thank you. Thanks for coming.